you know, that wasn't an All Ireland winning performance. Probably should have won the game based on their second half performance. Is it exceptionally hard to say it was the performance so far of the World Cup? Maybe not. OTBAN's performance rankings with Gillette. I'm, I'm, I'm scratching my head. That performance is we've just lacked that intensity. Let's get straight into it, into the red this morning. And um, I think we're going to start with Manchester United, who were oh so close and yet oh so far on Saturday afternoon to Manchester City. Um, and there is a gap between the teams. Regardless of the 2 1 result, I think it's fair to say there is a, a gulf. Um, United trying to, of course, stop the treble. Uh, next weekend, this inevitable treble that City are. I mean, probably going to complete this weekend. It's not to say Interman won't show up and, and cause some destruction potentially, but uh, I have to say, Jared, I'll hold my hands up a little bit here on Jaden Sancho. Uh, so I watched him closely when I was at Old Trafford recently against Wolves. I've watched him very closely in recent matches. I watched him closely on Saturday, and he's just, at the moment, not good enough. He's been really, really poor. Um, I mean, you're just waiting for Garnacho to be sprung from the bench, uh, and eventually they, they bring Garnacho on. They don't bring Sancho off just yet. Uh, Garnacho just lights the game up, uh, and all of a sudden United looked in the last 15, 20 minutes like they could maybe um, get an equaliser or take the game to extra time. They weren't clear cut chances. Like at the end, McTominay's header bounces off the top of the crossbar, goes behind for a corner. Um, but there's just so many areas of United's team that need improvement. Like Maguire will be gone this summer, you'd imagine. He's been left in the fringes. Will he? Well, I can't see sure. him coming back in. Well, I can't. I, uh, okay. Like Martinez wasn't even involved the weekend, and Maguire just doesn't have a, a sniff. Um, you can see him in the photograph there trying to. Console. Will he be gone though? I'm just not sure. Well, unless he wants to be a bit part squad player and uh, wear the armband when he comes on in the car. They were saying Cup. they're going to have to give him ten million in cash to leave to make up for the uh, reduction in wages that whoever signs him will have to pay. So, like, I don't know. The the the. They're paying now for the sins of chronic mismanagement over the last 15 years. And uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how quickly they can come out from under that because clearly they've got a good manager who's able to um, make these players play at a certain level. But to get to the next level... I, I think Eric Ten Hag is a manager that can take it out to the next level. I think there are, although they're in the red this morning, like there are positives. If you'd said to United fans at the start of the season, you'll win a trophy, albeit the Carabao Cup, and you'll get top four, I think they would have taken it. Like and then get into an FA Cup final. You're as telling well. me it's a good season, Shane. <laughs> it's You're a, telling me it's a good season. It's an improvement. It's a better season than Arsenal season. No, if, I had said if they'd won the FA Cup and the Carabao Cup and finished top four it would have been a better season for me in my opinion than Arsenal season as things materialised I think what you said, uh, listen li- play the tip play the tip <laughs> everybody's happy after the bank holiday weekend we're not going yeah to. exactly um, David De Gea is a problem I have to say uh, his distribution again on Saturday left uh, much to be desired it just doesn't fill you full of confidence and, and then again you get the golden glove this season in the Premier League most clean sheets so you look at that stats wise and you think oh, all is well in the uh, but that is Spanish also cave. like one element of yeah. a goalkeeper's game like most clean sheets doesn't actually talk about well how well did you were you on the ball when you had it how well did you like put it out to everyone else mm. you know how much were you actually stopping in and around the box? You, like, I don't know how much winning a Golden Glove and those sort of individual awards actually tells how good a player is. It's the same with like most goals. You can be like, okay, yes, you're good at scoring, but you could also sit in the box and poach goals all day long, or you could mm. be absolutely useless to the team the rest of the time, which is fine sometimes and probably better for a goal scorer than a goalkeeper but I think like Roy, Roy Keane has been on the record as saying I, I didn't, didn't care if I played with a striker who didn't run one little bit if they scored 25-30 goals a season I was happy with that is it the same for goalkeepers if you get me no. X number of clean sheets no. per season I'm sure the clean sheets aren't a function of just the goalkeeper they're a function of the whole team's approach to defending and like uh, with respect Roy wasn't it turns out the best judge of players like he was a world class midfielder but it turned out he wasn't a brilliant manager like oh he's a goal scorer he's a goal scorer he's a goal scorer is like well I mean come on that just could be man management skills though maybe you can spot a player but can't uh, you know control the dressing room kind of thing yeah. I don't know uh, I, I, like, I don't know where United go beyond the hair like just sign a goalkeeper who knows what Ten Hag wants and, and can do stuff like we you know you would hope that they have better scouting than uh, us who are casually watching a league and a half across Europe mm. do you know they should be able to find a goalkeeper who can do whatever Ten Hag needs yeah no it's fair um, like 
there's going to be a lot of United fans this morning tuning in and going, why are they in the red? Yeah, well, that's what I'm asking. So come on, give me, give me the reasons why they're in the red. Because well, like, it, they had an OK season. They lost the cup final. The trouble here is that it's Man City that are doing it to them, right? Like, you know, you actually would, it would be much worse if it was Liverpool about to win the treble. I understand that. But if, uh, if Man City's lawyers manage somehow to make whatever the punishment is for the alleged breaches that they have uh, been involved in, um, uh, so small that they're not ever going to go away which is possible right or even if they go away for a season because of it they're never really going to go away and so Ten Hag has to be an absolute genius and all of the signings need to work out yeah like you know Anthony needs to take a step next year to being a goal scorer and a creator whoever comes in now to replace whoever leaves needs to be really good from the get go and are they going to have any money so like that that's the one thing that would have me thinking um there's no guarantee that next season offers significant progress from this season. I, I think the green the green things are Anthony has improved. Uh, Ten Hag is clearly a very good manager. If Kane and, and Mount come in, that improves the team. Martinez was missing at the weekend and Anthony was missing at the weekend. Veghorst will be gone. Maguire will be gone. There'll be some dead wood gone next season. The red things are the ownership situation is, is a mess. It's dragging on far too long um, and that's probably leaving the transfers a little bit up in the air. Um, so, it, it, and there is also, really. but like you also did lose the FA Cup final. Like yeah. they did lose, and they were so off the pace of City. Like watching that game, there was v- maybe like once or twice where United actually looked like they were going to score from that. I think they had three shots on target across the entire game. City dominated in possession. They looked comfortable. They looked like they could just like go up another gear. And like yeah, obviously there is all the money thing which should be talked about and has to be talked about. But like also a Manchester United fan sitting back and saying I, you know, this is this is a good place for us to be right now is not the sort of Manchester United that we're used to. And for me, at the end of the season, I think that's a very good reason for them to be in the red, including in all the stuff you just mentioned. Mm. And the fact that, like, across the club, it's, like, it's also just not the men's team as well. Like, it's the women's team where they had a very productive season, but now we don't know how they're going to be able to... Build on it. Build on it whatsoever. Like, the official supporters group at the weekend was writing to the club and saying, saying well here we keep talking about like how the men's side are going to benefit from this supposed ownership takeover but nowhere has it actually said that you know they're going to improve where the team are playing they're going to improve facilities they're going to give money for transfers coming in like United are likely going to lose one of their best players in Alessio Russo this summer and they also can't plan to how they're going to replace her because everything is up in the air mm-hmm. and you, there are the green shoots and maybe you're right during what you say in that you need every signing to work out but you could also look at it in the sense of uh, Arsenal and what Arteta has done and taking those few years and building but there needs to be that support there and because that support is unknown at the moment we can't we have no idea how United are going to do next season it's a bit up in the air isn't it what do you want for the ownership uh, like Jim Ratcliffe I was speaking to a mate of mine who's a United fan the weekend and he was like he couldn't believe I was saying Jim Ratcliffe he was like do you not want do you not want the money in from Qatar and I was like no <laughs> like I've given out enough about, about Newcastle and the Saudis I can't exactly be a hypocrite and say I'd, I'd love the Qatari money football fans Shane I think you'll find that the hypocrisy goes uh, hand in hand and look not that any of these rich people look it's all a bit dirty in, in, in a sense but I mean lesser two evils to a degree like, I think a lot of United fans are split on that it's 50-50 but uh, we'll see in the next couple of months. I think they probably would have been in amber maybe overall for me, United, but I can see the argument for them being in red this morning. Okay, so who else is in red? Yeah, we're going to put Meath uh, in the red as well, the, the Meath lady specifically, because Davy Nelson stepping aside um, at the weekend in the statement, by the way, it was just a little bit strange as yeah, so the mid senior ladies team in the middle of the, the championship or the middle of the, the year essentially uh, on the lookout for a new management team so the county board confirming Nelson and his assistants uh, will not be in charge at the start of the All-Ireland series that begins later this month uh, they're going to play Waterford um, so they finished second from bottom in Division 1 of the league this year Meath and then lost to Dublin in the Leinster final last weekend granted the performances haven't been great and, and certainly uh, compared to the Meath performances of the last couple of years you've you, won win in like seven games or something yeah, like, it's not good but I mean 
you should surely see out the summer and see how the summer goes teams uh, it's happened before teams come good Kerry in 2009 were, were famously in the men's side of things poor and then we all know what happened they went on and win the All-Ireland um, and they're only three weeks out from that game against Waterford no management now there's talk that uh, Eamon Murray who of course Stevie Nelson and his management team replaced is potentially considering coming back out of retirement and entering the setup that was in the Meath Chronicle certainly uh, over the weekend uh, as one option. I wonder are they trying to manifest that though at this stage, like as a solution? Because if they don't get him back, mm. then you've got a temporary management team in place two weeks out from the start of the championship with a side who, you know, shorn of um, uh, some superstar talent, but like. Uh, back-to-back defending champions that's a big deal you know yeah uh, the, the, the writing was on the wall probably when they were involved in that relegation uh, playoff against Donegal in the league and you're thinking well, me should be pushing for a, for a Division 1 title here they shouldn't be trying to stay up but if that was the case I, like it just seems so laid on to be doing it like a 100%. couple of weeks out from the championship he was only in for eight months was it starting in October mm-hmm. last year um, and the fact that like it's the entire team so you're not even leaving someone there to kind of you know take up the baton and kind of fill the gap while you try and get someone else in because that statement wasn't particularly clear and the fact of it like was it the Meath board that was saying we don't want you anymore was it players was it the they had had enough you know like uh, did they walk away it's definitely uh, there's some reporting still to be done on this Mm. situation because they said with regret Meath LGFA announced that the county senior management will not be taking the team forward Um, so yeah the the phrase is is a bit strange Um, head coach Mark Brennan gone as well you you just wonder now the reporting on Eamon Murray from the Meath Chronicle was that he could be convinced to come out of retirement Right. so it's certainly quite vague um it's like they're reporting about Brendan Rogers this morning across yeah, all of it. Could he be could convinced. be convinced. <laughs> yes, you wonder, but uh, yeah, I think I think for that reason and that reason alone, as as Kathleen says, uh, in the middle of the uh, of the year when the championship is just around the corner, that's probably why Meath deserve to be in the red. So it's uh, it's worrying. It was uh, Fergal Lynch, the sports editor of the yeah. Meath Chronicle, who was reporting that um, Amy Murray could be could be convinced. Um, so yeah, that is the story with that one. We'll get to Brendan Rogers in a minute because um, mm-hmm. we're moving on to the Amber. Yeah, and uh, Celtic, I think. Oh look, we're right forward. there, right now. Straight away, what a segue! Um, Celtic, of course, in the Amber because from a green perspective, I guess, uh, seeing a record-breaking eighth domestic treble, that three-one win over Inverness Cali Thistle uh, over the weekend as well, um, and a fifth treble in seven years, which I mean, just isn't bad and Postacoglu winning was it uh, I mean all but one of the available trophies to him in his, in his time in charge at Celtic um, and f- from the moment Kyogo for the hash, he scores that opening goal you're thinking okay this is, this is game over Inverness made it a little bit interesting pulling one back at, at, uh, at 2-1 but uh, certainly from a Celtic perspective great weekend except for the fact that of course Ange Postacoglu the man the fans love the man who has been involved in so much good recruitment the man that has brought a, an attacking style of play to uh, Celtic Park that fans have just fallen in love with is uh, is out the gap um, certainly he was very vague in his post-match press conference after the match of the weekend saying you know I just want to enjoy this for the next 24 48 hours until someone grabs me by the collar and says we well, got to talk about your future because um, he's going on a family holiday I think today and Postacoglu so you'd imagine the discussions will have been quite intense yesterday with Tottenham um, but it seems according to reports this morning that uh, it's all but over the line uh, we just need to see Ange essentially holding a Tottenham Hotspur jersey and that's the, the last little step um, two year contract seems to be the, the discussion coming out of North London um, it's a great deal for Spurs I said last week in the show I, I felt Ange should, should probably stay and avoid the, the potential mess that is uh, Mr Levy's Tottenham but I mean I can see why he took the job at the same time yeah well he wants to be in the Premier League and realistically at the moment that's probably the best job out there I mean I still am curious as to how this one is supposedly supposed to work if he's the sort of manager who doesn't like that much over over people overseeing him all that much because you look at the way Spurs have conducted themselves over the last couple of years and the involvement of Daniel Levy that doesn't sound like the sort of club that Ange will I'm not sure about that I think that Levy tends to do the business of the football club in terms of um, length of contracts and transfers but he's not down saying that oh, I don't like your uh, three attacking players or we can't sign these players like it did look like um the Paratici when he was there had free reign to sign within within the budget so and that's that's kind of how it works like everybody has a boss somewhere like even Levy has a boss you know You'd, yeah and 
you, you can you can understand things completely from Ange Postecoglou's perspective. The question for Se- from Celtic's point of view is who the hell do they go to next? Brandon Rogers. It, well, is he the obvious one? Well, uh, no, I, not at all. But Rogers has been linked with it here on the back of the mirror, or the back of the star today, and and other places. Mm. One of the I'm like what? One of the, my one of my mates from home who's a big 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 Celtic fan. I asked him at the weekend who do you want, and he said straight away without hesitation, Brendan Rodgers. Um, David Moyes is a is, is another name that's been linked. Graham Potter is available. Frank Lampard's available. Ooh, uh, like, no, these are not the same things. No, Celtic fans will probably want continuity as well. Like John Kennedy is obviously highly thought of, but Andrew will more than likely want him at Spurs as well was he not there beforehand did he not was he did, uh, so I don't know is, is Curry, did Kennedy join Celtic with Ange or was he pre-date? I think uh, he predates him doesn't he he possibly predates him but certainly he's been under that management team Harry Kuehl has been one of the senior coaches as well so he brought him with him so Graham Garton was on Saturday saying that basically apart from Kuehl everybody was there already Strachan's son mm. and it sounded like Kennedy and the, so basically he can work with anybody essentially uh, like, he seems like a man who can get on with anyone Um now, which of those names is most likely, if you're to believe the bookies, it's Brendan Rodgers. Rodgers wants to take a year out of football, was what um, they're saying in the piece in the Star today, but um, but who knows? Yeah, and then look, Kyogo Farahashi as well, like the, the rumours are that, of course, Ange wants to bring him with him, mm. uh, and Kyogo, I'm sure, would not turn down a move to the Premier League if it, if it came about with a manager who already likes him. Um, so from a static perspective, it was a good weekend in that they saw the silverware, but yeah, worrying times until they find a successor that uh, I guess all the fan base gets behind. So Kennedy, Celtic. Yeah, Kennedy has been at Celtic since 2010, 2010 under some capacity. But Jachi, it could be an interesting, I mean, he's been a caretaker manager before, but could be interesting to have someone who's been, like, spent so long with the team and also with so many different various parts with it. Like, he's worked with the under 19s, he was a scout, um, he worked with the, the development squad. Uh, and he then became first team coach in 2014. So, uh, Jesse Marsh, another name that's been uh, been linked, um, and Enzo Moresca as well, the former Italian midfielder. You'd hope that they did the same thing they did the last time, and and that they're using their um, scouting department to find the next Ange. Like that seems to have worked pretty well. Yeah, as he said himself, he was a joke. He was a joke when he came in, or a joke figure. No one knew who he was. It was who's, this, who's this guy from the Japanese J League and the Australian A League? But uh, clearly, uh, the scouting works uh, in terms of managers as well. So it remains to be seen over the next coming days who Selic opt for. Also in the amber, we're going to go with this morning in Gaelic Games, and I know we have Anthony Moyles coming up on the show later on, but um, we're going to touch on the All-Ireland contenders, I guess. Would you call it a race to the bottom, maybe, <laughs> in the Sam Maguire this year? Because none of them really want to power ahead and show it. Galway are the only unbeaten team in the in the championship this year of of those contenders that you, you would say, so for me Galway are top of the. Well, they only have won every game. The which? The only, the yeah, the only thing that sorry won every game. Um, so from that perspective, you probably have Galway top of the pile. Uh, like Kerry. Sorry, the reason that they're they're all in amber is that their injuries are beginning to mount up. Yeah. So we Galway saw are part of that. Galway, Finity, and and Walsh. We saw uh, Kerry have had some injury issues. The Dubs don't look the same team when they don't have McCaffrey. Uh, mm. Like now, in fairness, in the second half, they were uh, pretty impressive against Kildare. And other than that, who else have we got? Mayo. Um, like I did say, I'm the, not playing. Killian O'Connor still not back. Well, this is it. But, but like I said in the quick picks of the weekend, or before the weekend, I said the Mayo Live game will be much closer than people realise. But that, that like, a lot of that is down to Castle Bar. I just thought Mickey Hart would be up for it. Um, and, and the, the style of play maybe doesn't suit Mayo it, they seem to struggle playing against certain styles of play this Mayo team um, and I know it was a late Louth goal to get them back into the game and, and they pushed up on Conor Grimes they were never that far off them either like there was two points in it for most of the yeah. game and like Louth were kind of keeping fairly toe to toe with them um, and, and like no one expected that at all like I was chatting to Colin Boyle before it started and he was like this is going to be an absolute whitewash which may as well have been a bit of the Mayo fog coming over him <laughs> but you know Nathan was making the point on Sunday that with Mayo they don't often whenever they have to come up against a top team like a Kerry they can put in the performance but when someone has to bring them down to their level they don't adjust as well and like the way that Loud defends just totally it looked like Mayo didn't know what to do and it was a completely opposite performance to what they had against Kerry mm, you'd be concerned if you were a Mayo fan a little bit from the performance of the weekend but then again they get over the line they got the win move on but you also wonder as well how much Mayo fans actually really cared about it like I think there was less than 10,000 people in Castlebar and like 
like. It's a lot, what I call lot it. of nice, lot of nice beaches in Mayo. You know, a lot, <laughs> yeah. lot of other things to do on uh, of a Sunday. Yeah, um, it's true. It's true. Uh, yeah, and then you look at teams. There are teams. Like, could this be a year where maybe a team comes in under the radar and wins in All Ireland? Like Tyrone. Well, Tyrone and Roscommon and Monaghan are going about their business very quietly. Little whispers. Um, I'm not saying either of either those three teams are necessarily going to win All Ireland. But uh, well, I think Tyrone have a chance. You know, they certainly know how to do it as a, as a squad and as a management team. But you would say that any of those three teams in that tier uh, all have the opportunity to to knock off one of the top seeds. Yeah. Like in an All Ireland quarter final weekend, all three of those teams are going to believe that they have a very good chance of beating whoever it is that they come up against. And particularly if you're Roscommon, mm-hmm. who are probably gone through the front door this stage are they? Yeah based well, on the scoring difference after the Sligo game although Dublin had a what was it a nine point win over Kildare as well so sorry actually there yeah well that'll go down to the last there, game regardless yeah, it'll like, go down there's a point and a difference between the two at the moment yeah so it's yeah, expected those to rack up a big score in the last one so possibly yeah and the same in the Monaghan Derry group they're, they're level on, on uh Head to head and and points and I think it's points scored the bottom of a slight advantage but yeah that'll go down to the last game that bye week is going to be really important to get players back that's like it, it's going to end up it it could end up being quite a serious thing to finish first versus second because if you have an extra week and all of a sudden a player who's not available is available that's the difference between winning the quarter final and buying a bit of time for yourself and also the difference in finish second and third is is humongous and getting that home advantage like you'd imagine three or four of those uh, matches will go towards the home team uh, I'd be shocked if, if if any more than one or two of those away teams won those preliminary uh, round robin games so um, that remains to be seen so, so the, yeah the weekend after next is huge in the football side of things ok uh, moving on to the green um, and first up on the green is Tom McKibben uh, what a performance from him at the weekend uh, 20 years of age Tom McKibben as well but you wouldn't know it to, to, to watch him at the weekend held his nerve in Hamburg uh, claiming his first DP World Tour title win two stroke victory at the uh, Porsche European Open and, and you have to remember as well that the two players that were kind of chasing him and hounding him for the for the duration of the final round Max Kiefer and Marcel Seem both German both home favourites um, and both desperately desperately under pressure from the, the home fans to, to get over the line um, a 15 year wait as well for a German winner on home soil um, and, and the three of them stared, shared the lead at one stage in the back nine but it was McKibben uh, made, makes the turn on three under par drops shots in the 11th and 13th holes uh, and you're thinking right, he's 20 years of age that might affect him a little bit but then birdie in the 15th moves clear and he had under um, earned his card for 2023 as well on the uh, European Challenge Tour graduated from that uh, he's of course a Hollywood Golf Club member as well similar to one Rory McIlroy um, and I mean he's just impressive and, and, and even listen to his interview afterwards um, talking about approaching the final days the same as the first three days and that sounds like such a simple thing to say but at 20 years of age to have the, 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 the wherewithal on the back nine to, to do what he did and he talked about on, on 18 he said my hands were alright I hit five iron I picked a club I knew it wouldn't go in the water right edge of the green and if it turned over I knew it would go further so I had no worries but it was such a good shot it felt pretty amazing talking about he felt he always was good enough to win but you, you can feel that but you have to actually get over the line and Tommy Kibben now mm. has got over the line I thought he was so impressive in his post-match or his post-game interview like just the way he was talking about the methodical way he thought through every single shot and where someone else he was like I know from the outside people are probably looking at that shot and thinking it was extremely difficult or I should have tried something easier but he was like I I knew I had it in me and I knew that that was the best shot for me in that moment so I went for it and like he wasn't even saying it in a like I'm great sort of way it was just a innate confidence in himself and where he's at and like for to hear a 20 year old speaking like that as well was yeah. absolutely mad and even his uh, he, he spoke afterwards about missing cuts by a single shot and very near misses in other tournaments as well and how much he's learned from those things and um at 20 years of age if you're not learning from your failures yeah. you're not going to go too far that's ah, incredibly has. exciting and um, you know the fact that he also comes from Hollywood and all those comparisons with McElroy are going to be very difficult for him to shake off but hopefully he wins more majors exactly so but also they seem to have been leaning into it as well over the last couple of years like you know McElroy has been very much helping him along he's been getting invited to various different events and you know he has already had that tagline for long enough that it seems that if he's starting to actually compete now it's something he's adjusted to rather than something he has to start adjusting to. Yeah, I think though it'll be way more prominent. Mm. Like um, it's in all the papers. Um, 
and and hopefully just enjoys it. Yeah, and sorry, someone said in the comments as well uh, that he should be higher in the uh, the green, greener than Money City, greener than Money City. But look, that's not really how we we do it, is it? Like if you're in the no, green, you're not, in the green. Not, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the shades of green, ignore. They don't those. matter. They don't matter. Yeah, yeah, McKibben, green, yeah. he's as green as can be. Um, McKibben in the green, and also in the green this morning. We've already touched on them, but, but, uh, City. but who's he going to play for in the Olympics? That's the big question this morning. We haven't answered why we know why. Uh, <laughs> That'll show us how well, green he is. Well, talk needs to answer this. <laughs> yeah. All the questions. Why are you ignoring the big questions? <laughs> Here we go. Uh, no, also in the green, deservedly. Manchester City. Um, I, I like superlatives. I'm not really going to use them, but uh, John Stones was brilliant at the weekend. Uh, Jack Grealish, his interview afterwards, filling Stones full of praise. Uh, after the 12 seconds, I think most people are sitting there in shock going, what's just happened? Uh, and Gundogan's strike was brilliant. Um, the second goal... I probably could question David De Gea's positioning and, and certainly United's marking on the edge of the box but you can't take away from the City result and performance and they got over the line and, and they've only one leg left of this uh, this treble this precedented treble I should say Pep Guardiola in tears as well um, but there's just so much positivity from Manchester City perspective as well all, uh, notwithstanding all the um, financial uh, irregularities to be investigated and, uh, Do you know what I thought was really interesting? Across the papers at the weekend, they were talking about City winning the FA Cup, but no one was actually talking about the fact that City won the FA Cup. It was almost like the there was nothing on the line on Saturday apart from United stopping City and City then going into the Champions League with the perspective of the, the treble on the yeah. line. And also, like, I don't think I read one article that mentioned the financial irregularities and I was like, have we already got to the stage where City are winning these things? And it just... It, it doesn't matter it doesn't factor in it's not even like a line at the end of a article saying like and of course City yeah. is still under investigation yeah it, it's a strange one isn't it um, the financial irregular, irregularities have to be mentioned uh, there, there has to be an asterisk put over until we know the results of this um, and yet look City fans are going to sit there going well look performances on the pitch still brilliant um, and they are and Pep Guardiola well he's already said hasn't he that he's going to stay on for another year after this season because you kind of some people are thinking you know he might walk into the sunset and uh, dance his merry way to uh, to another year's break but um from a city perspective the Bruyne are brilliant as well albeit well marshaled by by Fred for for some portions of the game Fred had an only an okay match but he certainly proved at Old Trafford earlier this season he can he can, he can track it was the probably Bruyne. one of the most impressive performances over the weekend yeah I like I know he wasn't able to keep on De Bruyne for the whole match I think like after about an hour he kind of started to drift off him a bit mm. but and Haaland wasn't uh, you know he wasn't the imperious he was pretty quiet he was quiet enough Greenish like, as well was quiet enough in parts he was um, yeah those little moments and flashes of brilliance as you're always going to get from, from Grealish and I think Haaland's main uh, moment was when he takes the ball into the corner uh, towards the end of the match and gives a little fist bump as Haaland tends to do when he wins a corner or a throw in um, but City yeah going into the Champions League final next weekend against Inter with, with history beckoning all guns blazing right yeah. that's this week's episode of the Gillette Labs Performance Rankings OTBAN's Performance Rankings with Gillette 